Well, thank you. So, according to the American Microprocessor Association, this year we will produce more transistors, the individual components that go into today's electronics, than individual grains of rice harvested on the planet at a lower cost. That's crazy! That's amazing! Inside of this box are about a million uh, grains of rice. A modern smartphone contains about a thousand boxes worth of this. This year, we'll make a billion of these cell phones. Wow. Now, since only one of ten transistors actually goes into uh, making a cell phone, you might ask yourself, where are they going? And how are they actually being used? So um, they're actually going into three classes of devices that not only process information, but interact with the physical world. Um, they are sensors, computers, and fabricators. And together, the combination will have enormous impacts on the way we design and make things. So think of sensors as devices that perceive physical properties uh, and translate them into a stream of, of useful digital information. And as you'd expect, uh, sensors are becoming incredibly cheap and immensely powerful. They measure everything from your heartbeat to the flow of traffic in cities and, and much, much more. Now, computers, uh, especially cloud computers, can process this information and they allow us to produce meaningful simulations. Okay? And they can uh, enable us to manipulate and experiment with these digital objects and digital models. Now, you've probably heard of uh, consumer 3D printers that pl print in plastic and resin, but the real advances are taking place in industrial machines that add material or sculpt them away. And they're printing everything from, well, jewelry all the way up to jet engine parts. So these technologies augment three capabilities that are central to the very act of design. Uh, sensors record or rip our physical world and help us provide a better understanding of context. Computers can modify these digital models to explore better alternatives, and fabricators can construct tangible objects and tangible things. And together, these three capabilities establish a powerful system of design, a new way of thinking of design uh, called RIP Mod Fab. So how does it work? So uh, say you wanted to design something like, uh, I don't know, say a pair of shoes. The traditional way of doing this is to begin with a, a generic model of a foot. That's called a last. And it acts as a reference guide that you can sketch on and doodle and make uh, alternatives. Um, and uh, as you do this, uh, you build prototypes in this iterative loop. And once you've selected a design that you like, you ship it to a factory, and eventually uh, you get the final shoe in maybe 12 to 15 months. Okay. Rip Mod Fab begins with the scan of your foot, with your exact footprint. And, um, you know, what's interesting about this is that uh, it can be done with cell phones for free, as you can do this today now. And so you have an exact model of your foot, which acts as a starting point to build a digital template, a digital version of it. And so the computer can then modify that model and simulate and build uh, the version and, t um, and get the one that you exactly want to have done. So, and once the mat mo model is complete, you can have it fabricated in, in a, using robotics and um, voila, a shoe. So that's the goal. Okay, it's not quite here yet, but it's coming. And what's interesting about this is that it's completely, potentially going to change the business model of footwear. You would buy the intellectual property of the shoe that fits you exactly, but you might lease the material of the, uh, shoe, of the printed shoe, returning it once it's finished. So, that's a simple example. Now, what if you wanted to take advantage of this crazy amount of technology that's available? Um, what if you wanted to design a strong and uh, light chair? So this simulation produced by David Benjamin starts by generating one chair, and then it evaluates it, determines its strength and, and other parameters. Then it does it again and again and again and again and again and again. It produces hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, displays them on a landscape. It can create more designs than any person here can create in a lifetime. Um, and you sort of play God, selecting the one that you want, and when you're ready, you print it out. Huh. So, wow, is that real? Yeah, it is real. So maybe that chair doesn't look particularly uh, comfortable or attractive, not intended to be. 
You could start by designing a, a bike and have a particular shape, and then have the computer modify the internal uh, parameters, creating a kind of lattice work that places material only where it needs to be. And you know, the interesting thing that, about this is that when you look at it close up, um, the computer discovers patterns that resemble something does that look familiar. It resembles microscopic bone. And uh, that's insane because it um, uh, mimics nature's solutions huh? through brute force. So different industries are beginning to use this kind of technology. This is the Irby. This is the first 3D printed car in my hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba, not an industrial center. Um, just recently, a, a company called Local Motors has uh, 3D printed a fully drivable car in 44 hours in 44 hours. That's two days. What does that mean for the automotive industry? That's uh, incredible. Um, in the construction industry, it's not uncommon to uh, scan an entire building by flying a drone around it, um, and then that gets converted into a digital model, which you can modify. That happens very quickly. And what's not so common yet are 3D printers, concrete printers, that will then fabricate this. But there is a Chinese company now that is already printing 10 houses a day for under $5,000 each. Yikes. So the lesson here is that as soon as information technology touches an industry, that industry is forever changed. It rides along the compounding growth of digital tools. So I think that RipMod Fab will fulfill the promise of uniting the digital with the physical way to uh, connect the uh, uh, customized products that are beautiful and functional and elegant. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg. So when you have a tremendous amount of computational power, you can optimize not just a, an individual component, but an entire system. So one manufacturer is improving an engine by starting with a piston that makes it lighter, and then that allows the return spring to be thinner, which then allows the shaft to be shorter, and then the changes cascade through the entire system, and they've been able to sh shrink the engine by two-thirds just by beginning with one part. This is the future of design. This is going to have, I think, really significant implications for designers as well as for engineers, um, because it's going to shift design from making forms to establishing goals and constraints and then allowing the computer to simulate the forms or discover them. It moves us from creating or um, ideas to searching for the best ideas, and it equips designers to comprehensively design entire systems. Hmm. So will this be used by uh, everyone? No, I don't think so. It's going to be really uh, most optimal for the, the wickedly complex projects. But I think it's really going to transform the very nature of design, make it far more organic than ever before. So more transistors than grains of rice. And by the way, this milestone happened in the year 2008. And it's been doubling ever since. And it's creating a world where digital power is essentially free and infinite. And it's kind of like giving us super design powers. It's allowing us to extend our senses to have an exquisite view of the world as it actually is. It's giving us super brain power to envision the world as we'd like it to be. And it's giving us magic capabilities for us to build just about anything. And I think the combination of this three capabilities, our ability to read, understand, and right back to the world is something to get pretty excited about. Thanks so much.